How's the royal family? I pray that everyone is doing well. First and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Lola and also Lisa Carrera. Um, those emails that y'all sent me were spot on. So, I'm going to take the royal family on a journey. This, vid this uh, video is going to be long, my royal family. So y'all know what y'all got to go do. Go get your shit. You know what I'm saying? So as I reduce this down a bit here so we can get a clear view. Um, I'm going to be very candid and very core like I always do. And just allow me to express myself. I really must express myself. And I had to do a lot of processing um before i just jumped up and did this video now most people know if anybody is new i do all videos based on pure emotion and i feel like you can get uh, you know i'm trying my best to be authentic and not organic so to speak so you can just you know i can flow with it so when coronavirus first hit, I was very disgusted how the Asian community whimpered and whined. Um, it was a lack of care of what was going on. I seen other races roll up their sleeves and say, okay, this is what we're going to have to deal with. And they even went as far up in New York having a hotline put together for them because they felt like they were the only ones being targeted, which was not true. Coronavirus has impacted the entire globe. It has hit every orifice you could think of. And a lot of people have had to make adjustments. So I had did a series of videos like many and I kept catching something that really turned me off. Um, and I mean, I did videos. I just didn't focus up here in California where I'm at. I went, you know, tried to cover all of the United States. And the thing that I noticed instantly was the Asian community, the way they talk to people, like, basically, you better come down here to my business. I didn't put a half, literally, somebody said a half a million into it. And my attitude was like, well, it's more of y'all than anyone. Why your own ain't patronizing you? See, coronavirus has pulled back the layers and really exposed many things, and it continued to. So... There's been a great deal of loss of capital, you know. And so now they're back on this, seeing that they're being um, attacked and targeted. There's a lot of people that have been attacked and targeted. But I tell you, some of the things that disgust me was to see what they were even doing to their own. And I did videos on it, spitting at their own, you know, spitting in the elevator and rubbing their, their spit all over the, the buttons and stuff like that, you know. And these were some, some of them were some really old people. And I'm like, damn, this is in their country? That, that mean, they want their own to get this? And then, you know, back over here in the stage, you're whining like you're the only one that's getting this? So now... They're saying there is a, unquote, uptick of violence um, towards the Asian community. But True Royal always look much deeper. And I'm going to drop them sweet, extra juicy nuggets. All right, my royal family? We're going to be core about this. And we're going to be real about this. Because some people are afraid to speak on this. Somebody have to. So I said, I'm going to be very, very candid on how I feel. So let's go on this journey, my royal family.
January 30th, 84-year-old Vita Ratanapati dies after an attacker sprints toward him and knocks him to the pavement. The next day in Oakland's Chinatown, a 91-year-old man is shoved to the ground by an assailant who's now been charged with three different assaults on that very day. I was just tired of seeing everything going on on social media, the attacks against the elders, them getting hurt, the robberies. It's just disgusting to look at. And I'm just like, why is nothing happening? We just sat out there for like 15 minutes and showed our presence over there. Okay, nice. Born and raised in Oakland's Chinatown, Jojo Al launched a fundraiser to hire armed private security guards to patrol Chinatown and nearby areas. To her surprise, she met her goal of raising $25,000 in one day, raised the goal to $50,000, and met that too. Honestly, I didn't know that it was going to spread like wildfire, and so many people were so concerned about it and wanted to do something but didn't know what. So, you know, you know I'm glad that I did this because, you know, the support that, you know, the merchants, they even say they feel safer. Some of the shoppers here, they feel safer. In 2020, Stop AAPI received more than 2,800 reports of hate incidents from Asian Americans. 8% of those were physical assaults. Women were harassed nearly two and a half times more than men. So the Asian American community is really fearful and concerned um, at this moment from both the racism of last year and then the current spate of violence. We don't know if this year's street crimes were necessarily racially motivated, but the effect is similar. You know, we're being traumatized this past weekend in Oakland and San Francisco, outraged citizens from all different backgrounds joined in solidarity. Eddie Zhang spent more than 20 years in prison for home invasion and kidnapping, but became a model prisoner and now a community leader. We are able to learn from each other, so therefore we are able to humanize each other. With a number of the attacks committed by black Americans, Zhang made it clear the worst thing to do is pit one race against another. We also need to hold the system and government accountable for their failure to address uh, white supremacy and systemic racism that continue to perpetuate anti-blackness and anti-Asians and using us as wedges, but really trying to create opportunity for post-cultural engagement and post-cultural healing. Right now, and our Asian brothers and sisters and our neighbors are going through some pain, and that the root causes of violence and crime is actually lack of resources. The activists say rampant violent crime in their community has always been there. But now people are seeing on video the brutality of the acts and the vulnerability of the victims. Many residents simply say they're fed up and will do whatever it takes to protect their neighborhoods. Well, I'm going to be very core. I, when I, when I seen this, because this is local, and me and my husband had a deep conversation about it. And my husband said that he just don't have no feelings around it. And I had the same type of feeling. I uh, didn't have any empathy. And so I said, I have to ad identify what's going on with me. So much um violence daily I often talk about every millisecond what is being done to the royal family every millisecond somebody's always doing something to us and then another race comes in and they talk about what's being done to them and they're making out that it's like disproportionately black folks are doing it and we must remember that here in America in the Asian community the reason why they are able to thrive is off of black dollars and it is a known fact which they still will not own up to it throughout America and they don't even have to be in America because they doing the same practice globally when it comes to the royal family that they're worried about their unquote bottom line and i guess they don't feel like they should suffer we all suffering we all sacrificing so now they on this bullshit about 
Black Lives Matter. Oh yeah, true world gonna get there to the juicy parts. Oh yes. I'm a very passionate, loving person. And I often talk about the nature of things. And it is disgusting to see any human being do that to anyone. You got elders out here getting killed because some nut didn't push them and, you know, they already fragile and they come up dead. Um, but what I don't like is to use that for your propaganda, you know, what you own. And I'm going to expose what you own because these, this stuff has happened in the black community where our elders have been attacked repeatedly. This stuff has happened in the white community and we can go a community after community. It ain't isolated to one community, but I do agree because of Rona people feeling some kind of way, you know, people's lives have been drastically, um, have drastically changed. And yes, you're going to have that element out there that going to blame naturally the Asian, um, community and all is woes it is what it is we get blamed for everything in the royal family it's the fiber of america to say black folks disproportionately black folks blah blah you know we hear it all the time and you know we pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and keep it moving so you know you keep living and you see different things you start getting an indifference, you know, it's quite deep, but I have sense enough to know, yeah, that's wrong, but we're going to keep it core tonight, you know, because I've heard some of us do these type of videos, our own, and, and repeatedly keep saying that's wrong, that's wrong. We don't even have to keep saying that's wrong, that's wrong. What you're doing is you refuse to identify with your feelings, how you feel about these people. You know, way before Rona, it showed up. Now they want to show solid solidarity, which you really own. Oh, True Royal will deliver like I always do. I make it real juicy. So as we continue on my royal family. A minority representing several countries, languages, religions, and skin colors, Asian Americans have found a new kinship with the black American struggle for social justice. Nancy Chen reports on why some believe this is the year the model minority has finally become woke. Tacos are like a quintessentially LA food. Everybody eats tacos. Everybody does indeed eat tacos, including the homeless in South Los Angeles. And you wanted 10 meals, right? Which is why every Friday, local restaurant owner Susan Park gives away thousands for free. And people feel like they're cared for. You know, it's like it's a food hug. The park is giving more than just a food hug. It's her way of supporting Black Lives Matter as she serves predominantly black neighborhoods. I know that it was black people and black bodies that were at the front lines of fighting for the Civil Rights Act to be passed. Their bodies were brutalized, and yet I benefit. Park created the Facebook page Asian Americans for Black Lives Matter after the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. This summer, the movement was reignited after George Floyd was killed, with many Asian Americans joining in the protests. Among them, 32-year-old Tiffany So. COVID-19 definitely sparked another awakening where Asian Americans um, and some younger generations of Asian Americans have been for the first time experiencing uh, this more overt in-your-face racism. Part of that awakening includes starting conversations about racial injustices with their families, bridging different views across generations as they question their place in America's racial fabric. Because race is talked about as if everything's black and white, Asian immigrants sometimes wonder, where do we fit in? 
Frank Wu is president of Queens College in New York. He's a scholar of Asian American studies. It's a moral dilemma. Are you going to declare that you're a person of color or do you aspire to be an honorary white? Or do you just get excluded as a perpetual foreigner? Right? Those are the Those options. are not good options at right. all. Right, yes. Yeah, none of those is good. Wu says part of that forced identity is shaped by the idea of the model minority, a belief that Asian Americans are more successful than other minorities because of hard work. It's false flattery. It's not even really a compliment of Asian Americans. It's just a way to denigrate other people of color of saying, look at the Asians. They made it. Why can't you? Stereotypes like these led to years of mistrust and unconscious bias among the communities. In the 70s, Korean Americans opened businesses in underserved neighborhoods in South LA. Sometimes there was tension. Frustrations came to a head in 1991 when 15 year old Latasha Harland was killed after a Korean store owner accused her of stealing orange juice. In this graphic security video, Harlins is shot in the back. Line of defendant Stacy C. Kuhn, not guilty of the crime of assault. And then a year later, when a jury acquitted white police officers for beating Rodney King, Los Angeles erupted. <laughs> Abandoned by law enforcement, stores were looted across South LA. More than 60% of the damage on Korean American businesses. We are human dignity. A history that motivates Danny Park today to build bridges. His family has operated a convenience shop in South LA for more than two decades. But after taking over the business, the 28-year-old is now empowering and uniting the community by training residents for jobs at his healthy food market. Among the items sold, an orange juice named after Latasha Harlins. Why do you think it's important to put that out front and have a reminder of that and remember in such a way? Um, I think it's a way to honor uh, our ancestor, um, honoring our ancestor Latasha Harlins, who's been killed and who has transitioned. We're working on ensuring that the violence and the harms don't happen again. Change is slowly coming. From a cup of orange juice to athletes like U.S. Open champion Naomi Osaka, who wore masks honoring black lives. The solidarity is inspiring to actor and activist George Takei. It is a much more heartening kind of movement with the, the diversity of America coming together. <laughs> As Susan Park continues to serve, she still receives dozens of messages from Asian Americans who want to get involved. Just listen to people and show that you care about them and that they want you to be their friend. Communities working together to create change. Still to come, power in numbers. How Asian Americans could have a big impact on the election this November. So... What I have to say about this segment that we just seen is something that I have often talked about. You don't get brownie points for doing the right thing. It's like, okay, thank you, but I'm not going to go falling all overboard. All right. It's like, I may see someone stumble and fall and I take the time to help them and the person says thank you. I'm th and that's that's it. I'm not fooled by this cuz I know what this is all about. Now I'm going to string it and milk it for all it's worth my royal family and I'll tell you in the end what it's all about. But y'all real sharp. Y'all know what this is all about and stuff. So yeah, you see people homeless, suffering, and all of that. And the right thing to do, if you have the means, is to go out and help your fellow man and woman and child. But I'm not going to give you anything extra. Thank you. That is the natural thing to do. All right? 
See, in the royal family, other races have shown kindness or an inkling of it. Let's say an inkling of it. And some of us will fall all overboard and, oh, Lord. And it literally drives me crazy. So I'm just not going to fall for that. It's a good thing. That's just like about, you know, attacking a human being um, and doing what they're doing to elders. That's disgusting. But these folks want us to like focus on, look, I, look at, look at what's going on with us. They're treating us bad. Whoa, me. Okay. What, what, what about what, what, what's been going on with black folks? Every millisecond. They have developed an indifference. And I feel some kind of way that you're going to name an orange juice after that girl, after she got her brains blowed out. And they allow that woman to um, go back to her country and lead her life. Ain't that something, my royal family? That you take an orange juice so you can continue to make your coins or some kind of little funky-ass jester letting white black folks know, oh, oh, you know, we feel. But really, they want you to, at the end of the day, you buy, you buy. That's how they talk to us. So, we're going to go a little bit more deep with my royal family. And um, I want y'all to listen to this. I for the matching marketing fund which can double the impact of your advertising in the first quarter of 2021 without increasing the cost. Don't wait. The deadline to apply is February 28th. Go to firstbayarea.com slash match to apply. That's firstbayarea.com slash match. The late winter is a special time for San Francisco's Chinatown because of the Lunar New Year. If you're in the city during this time, there's a really unique energy. You'll hear firecrackers, there are street fairs, you can get delicious food like steamed whole fish, chewy tang yuan, and longevity noodles. And of course, there's a massive parade. It's one of the largest Chinese New Year celebrations in the entire world. But this year, the atmosphere is much more muted. Even before COVID-19 hit the Bay Area in 2020, Chinatown was experiencing the first impacts of the coronavirus pandemic, which turned this vibrant neighborhood into what feels like a ghost town. Hey there, people. You are listening to the Extra Spicy Podcast. I'm Justin Phillips. And I'm Soleil Ho. Today, we're looking at San Francisco's Chinatown, a year on from the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Every community all across the globe has been affected by the virus. But as we know, not all experiences are the same. We'll be hearing about some of the hurdles Chinatown has faced as a community, how people are overcoming those challenges and what the future might hold. Yes, and in doing this, we're gonna be sharing the microphone with a lot of different people, community members, neighborhood leaders, chefs, business owners, and more. But first, we're gonna throw it to our producer, Taya Francesca Price. This was the sound on Jackson Street back in late January of 2020. The sidewalk was covered in strips of red tissue paper. The air smelled sort of burnt because firecrackers and fireworks were going off constantly. It was about 10 o'clock in the evening and, you know, people were just walking around, casually leaving bars arm in arm. Some, like myself, were carrying leftovers from dinner and there was just an excitement around. You could see everyone was smiling, laughing, having a great time because this was before coronavirus really hit. It was before our lives changed. Or at least that's what we thought. It turns out that right around this time, the first signs of the pandemic's impact were already creeping into the neighborhood. Well, I think we were hearing from Chinatown as early as the end of January, early February that things were not right. That's Janelle Bitker. She's a food enterprise reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle. She's been covering the impact of the pandemic on restaurants since the very beginning. If you walk down Grant Street, then it 
it was really striking. I remember walking down Grant Street on a weekend and going into Eastern Bakery for some crunch cake and the owner was like, oh, you're here, you're local, please come back, we need you. And and it was such a sad moment because I had never seen Chinatown look like that. It's always elbow to elbow with tourists and, and people taking photos and people grocery shopping. And it was just stunning to see it empty out and, and not just from tourists, but it seemed like over time, people in San Francisco were also not going to Chinatown. The double whammy of that is January, February, especially February, is usually the busiest time in Chinatown. It lines up with Lunar New Year. It's when people fly in from all over the world to celebrate. Um, There's usually massive banquets for weeks and hundreds of people are getting together and spending lots of money. And the small businesses in Chinatown usually get 30% of their annual income just in that month-long Lunar New Year period. So to lose that and then have the pandemic really shut things down was pretty brutal. San Francisco's Chinatown has almost a thousand ground floor retail spaces. It's a big gateway for immigrants coming to the Bay Area because there are a lot of starter jobs, which makes it a good place to slide into the American economy. That said, it's also important to keep in mind that this is one of the densest residential neighborhoods outside of Chinatown in New York. Roughly 14 to 18,000 people live in about a 24 block radius, and nearly 60% of the housing units are single room occupancy hotels, or SROs. It's a bustling neighborhood, and this is just a snapshot of the number of people within the community. But on top of that, thousands of tourists from all around the world visit this part of the city every year. And food, in particular, is a really big part of the draw. You know, the busiest streets in Chinatown are the markets. That's Brandon Ju, chef and owner of the restaurant Mr. Ju's in Chinatown. And usually it's, you know, these huge, huge piles of uh, produce that has, you know, just been dropped off and it's still like in the boxes that they, they, they came in and there's people going through and trying to search for the very best thing they have. I mean, I always felt like You know, that was a real big part of kind of feeling like luxurious in a way. Ju is a San Francisco native. He actually lives in the house that was his grandparents. And he's a trained chef. His restaurant gained a ton of attention when it first opened in 2016 for its take on Cantonese-American cuisine. I mean, I pretty much can guarantee, like, if anyone went to Chinatown right now, that there would be an ingredient that they have never seen and might not know how to use. And I think that part of it is like really, it's really intriguing because there's so, you know, your curiosity can really be, you know, sparked from from all of the things that are that are in Chinatown. I feel really lucky because I have, there's, I've been getting so much influence from being just in Chinatown. The history, even the, even like what's going on now, there, there's so much going on that I think there's a built-in energy to to the neighborhood. Uh, Ju took three years to transform his restaurant space, which overlooks Grant Avenue. It used to be the Four Seas restaurant for 50 years, a banquet hall. And these venues are a big part of the community's history because it's where meetings, events, and weddings all took place. When I went upstairs and I saw this huge open banquet room, I started to realize like I had been there before. You know, I wanted to have a restaurant in Chinatown, but I I think initially I was really only looking for a space around 2,500 square feet. And to put that in context, that is only a quarter of the size of what Mr. Jews is at this point. What I had remembered walking upstairs was that my uncle got married there. We had ready ginger parties there. And when I remembered like those like those events, I remember it being like packed and and really fun and festive. And I I remember that it could be that, and it was that, and that I had a growing sense that it was actually something that could be relived again. The time spent fundraising to bring his vision for the restaurant to life really paid off. Once Mr. Juice opened and momentum for the restaurant grew, Ju eventually opened Moongate Lounge, a lounge and event space right above the restaurant. We had just kind of started 
to really kind of get the two kind of working together. There was, you know, the restaurant downstairs and then there was this lounge and event space upstairs. And, you know, by the time the pandemic hit, we were, you know, 60 employees, um, you know, two floors of, of operation. Um, Gosh, what timing. I'm so sorry. I know. I, know. <laughs> I mean, the one question that I had was, you know, how business changed when, you know, the onset of the pandemic was. But I imagine sort of like the food traditions of, of like you said, going to the market and, and getting ingredients and just sort of that whole network probably was tossed up into the air. So so what was that like? I, I think when I was kind of assessing, like, you know, really what our mentality was last year during during Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year, really was like this feeling like it was not going to last very long and that we would be maybe rolling back into a normal life. And I think, I, you know, we can go back to just, you know, our, our politicians at the highest level, like Trump, just not acknowledging the seriousness of, of the pandemic. Many call it a virus, which it is. Many call it a flu. What difference? So how could we even think that it would be as serious as, as we should have taken it? Um, you know, we were a little buffered from some of the early effects of the pandemic because we had a reservation system. We had already been booked up for two months. So the way that we saw those being affected is as we got closer to that shutdown day by day, week by week, we would be getting more cancellations. It's really hard to really know what was being affected in the form of, you know, xenophobia versus tourism. I want to also acknowledge that there's this real like slowdown of tourism. And I think also that the tech companies, they were telling all of their workers to stay home and to work remotely. Those two things were happening at the same time as really also this xenophobia. As we got closer to that shutdown, you actually realize there is no more foot traffic. There is no one to fulfill those cancellations and more cancellations were happening because either people were not comfortable because of what they were hearing about the pandemic or because they were not comfortable coming to Chinatown. As coronavirus spread around the world, so did misinformation. It triggered reactions of fear and hate towards people of Asian descent. Paranoia and misconceptions about how the virus was spreading led to reduced business, and this coincided with reports of verbal and physical attacks. In many ways, this behavior was stoked by leaders who repeatedly used anti-Chinese rhetoric as a way to divert questions about how the pandemic was being handled. Every day. Well, they're losing their lives everywhere in the world. And maybe that's a question you should ask China. Don't ask me, ask China that question, okay? When you ask them that question, you may get a very unusual answer. Especially because of what Trump was continuing to say, even, you know, from the beginning to the very end, he just continued to really point out China, China as Chinese. As opposed to calling it the Chinese virus. It really affected the neighborhood. You know, that part of it makes me angry because it's it's like that that part was added on top of the difficulty of everything that, that the pandemic has really proved to affect. I, it became more clear to me that I had to become more of an advocate for Chinatown and, and that our voice needed to be um, really heard. And it, I think it continues to be a real question mark of what are, are the lingering repercussions of that rhetoric that was being just continued to be finger pointed to Chinese people. This isn't by any stretch of the imagination. The first time Chinatown as a community has been the subject of xenophobia. In fact, its very existence is inextricably linked with the history of Sinophobia in this country. I mean, we're talking about a really historic neighborhood, you know, like Chinatown is what, nearly as old as San Francisco, right? Yeah, I mean, the first Chinese immigrants who arrived back in 1848 at the start of the gold rush settled around what is now Grant Avenue, the single location where it was legal for Chinese people to actually live. So for a long time, it was seen by the government and the white gentry as what Obi-Wan Kenobi would describe in Star Wars as a hive of scum and villainy. 
I know, it's very screwed up. So the government mostly tolerated it in exchange for cheap labor in the mines, just in factories, railroads, that sort of thing. The anti-immigrant sentiment got so bad that it resulted in multiple laws restricting the movement of Chinese people here, including a straight-up Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned Chinese immigration to the U.S. from 1882 to 1943. I mean, Chinatown um, is resilient, you know. That's Malcolm Young, the executive director at the Chinatown Community Development Center, or the CCDC. The CCDC was founded in 1977 and came out of an activist movement trying to ensure that Chinatown would remain an immigrant gateway. He says Chinatown has been resilient since the beginning, when the community was under constant attack. You know, for, for the community to have survived that, uh, I think, is, is fairly amazing. The 1906 earthquake, when uh, our city fathers and I, white fathers, um, you know, tried to move Chinatown uh, out to the mud flats in the southeast uh, in order to take advantage of the incredible, um, you know, proximity of the real estate in Chinatown. Uh, you know, and then, of course, um, uh, World War II, the 60s era redevelopment area and downtown expansion, you know, Chinatown survived that. We made it through the, the tech boom when real estate pressures were happening. And I think the common thread uh, throughout all of that uh, has has been, I think, genuine community leadership um, in the 1800s, 1900s, you know, up until the 60s, um, you know, the family associations and the regional associations, the role that they played in, in keeping Chinatown, Chinatown was completely amazing, stellar. I think there's a an impulse to think of activism, especially, you know, the civil rights activism stuff being part of history, but really it extends to this present day and there is actually a really timely angle with all this community organization. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, throughout the pandemic, there's been like a concern about preserving these neighborhoods, but on a very human element, like looking back at what you mentioned with the timeliness of this all, we're also having discussions about uh, crimes that are happening in these neighborhoods against Asian residents. And it's complicated. You know, there have been some high profile things that have been caught on video, whether it's, you know, an individual being shoved to the ground, someone breaking into, a, you know, stealing things out of a store. And, you know, it it does highlight the concern that exists within these neighborhoods. And there's a lot of dialogue about how this is happening, why it's happening, who the perpetrators are, you know, anti-Asian racism, anti-Black racism. It's just a really big conversation. But at its core, it goes back to the preservation of a neighborhood. And it even gets more granular than that and focuses on the individual lives and the experiences that they're having there. So there's like a whole timeliness to this discussion. Right. It's a renewed conversation about how to keep the neighborhoods, including San Francisco and Oakland's Chinatowns, safe spaces for Asian Americans in this region. You're listening to the Extra Spicy Podcast. We'll be right back after a quick break. You can support this podcast and the newsroom that creates it by signing up for a San Francisco Chronicle membership at sfchronicle.com slash pod. Even with the optimism of the new year, the road to business as usual will be uncertain. That's why Hearst Bay Area, the marketing and advertising powerhouse behind the San Francisco Chronicle and SF Gate, is inviting local businesses to apply for the matching marketing fund, which can double the impact of your advertising in the first quarter of 2021 without increasing the cost. Don't wait. The deadline to apply is February 28th. Go to hearstbayarea.com slash match to apply. That's hearstbayarea.com slash match. You're listening to the Extra Spicy Podcast, and we're back with more on how Chinatown is facing the pandemic. Here's producer Taya Francesca Price. When the coronavirus pandemic led to a shelter-in-place order in March, restaurants in San Francisco pivoted quickly. They turned to technology, hopping on food delivery apps, offering takeout, and creating meal kits. But as Malcolm Young of the Chinatown Community Development Center pointed out, for businesses in Chinatown, especially small monolingual places, adapting was trickier. The, the Chinatown restaurants in particular were really not designed, you know, to work with the, the economy that San Francisco has transformed into. And I think restaurants were starting to then be in a situation where they had to make some difficult decisions. Chelsea Hung is the owner of Washington Bakery and Restaurant, which her parents opened when they immigrated to San Francisco. Next month is actually the restaurant's 25th year anniversary. But 
when the pandemic began, Hung said that their business had to make some really tough calls. So we actually decided to close for about a month, just trying to navigate um, what what our next steps are. We weren't sure how serious the whole situation was, and we wanted our team to be safe. So yeah, we had to make the hard decision of letting go of pretty practically most of our team, and we closed and kind of waited around and we decided to open um, for takeout but it just wasn't enough um, it without um, a whole month of income and just so much uncertainty it, it was just really really difficult so back in late march of 2020 malcolm young and the ccdc worked to provide meals for people living in single room occupancy situations by developing a program called Feed and Fuel. We started planning for it, you know, in late March, early April, and then launched it in mid-April. So, um, you know, we kind of got to work really fast after the pandemic uh, started. Um, you know, back then, our, our primary concern uh, was spread in SROs. We weren't quite sure, you know, about what you know, the deal with the virus is, but we knew that, you know, kind of communal kitchen use, communal um, bathroom use was going to be problematic. So, um, you know, the first feed and fuel iteration really was focused on this idea of trying to um, provide meals to SRO residents uh, as opposed to groceries to, to get them out of the kitchens as much as possible. Um, to do that, um, we um, partnered with just a number of different folks. Um, we partnered with uh, SF New Deal, uh, who we're partnering with again now. We partnered with uh, Self Help for the Elderly um, in their meal delivery program. Uh, and then we also directly partnered with uh, 34 restaurants in Chinatown um, to create a voucher system uh, whereby SRO residents could come and, and essentially use these vouchers at the restaurants to, to basically get takeout meals so that they didn't have to use the communal kitchens. And back at Washington Bakery, Chelsea Hung said programs like this really helped her restaurant stay afloat. We were able to apply for some programs, so we partnered up with one of uh, the meal programs, SF New Deal which gave us more consistent revenue as well as help uh, seniors with food insecurities. So we provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner and deliver it to uh, the seniors that are participating in the program. The first iteration of this feed and fuel program stopped back in July due to a number of factors, but the primary one was a lack of funding. However, at the same time, outdoor dining was picking up and people were going back to work, so it really did seem like a good time to pause. But like Malcolm Young pointed out, everyone was afraid of a COVID surge. And sure enough, in the fall, the surge hit. Uh, for the first time, we were starting to see steadily increasing numbers in Chinatown, uh, particularly in SROs, which was really worrisome. And then, you know, on top of that, uh, outdoor dining shut down and restaurants were then really starting to... Um, indicate that they were going to fail. The canary in the coal mine was was really when Far East announced that they were going to close um, by the end of last year. That was a, a pretty devastating announcement and, and would be a devastating blow if, that, if, if we can't keep them open, frankly. Far East Cafe is one of Chinatown's oldest restaurants. It's 100 years old, and it's one of just two remaining banquet halls in the neighborhood. So in early December, a coalition of Chinatown organizations joined together to identify what was needed to really save this community. Later that month, relaunching Feed and Fuel was prioritized. Malcolm Young said that having SF New Deal, a nonprofit organization, step up to run the second iteration of the program really was the catalyst to getting everything going. You know, we got a an immediate $500,000 commitment from Human Services Agency, Shreem McSpadden, you know, with uh, with kind of the mayor's, you know, nudge. Uh, we got a, a commitment to SF New Deal to kind of start the program. Then the Board of Supervisors approved $1.9 million in aid to Chinatown restaurants a measure introduced by District 3 Supervisor Aaron Peskin. Yeah, Taya, let, let's, let's be clear. Everybody needs help. Interestingly enough, as lowest transmission rates in the city, they have become the model neighborhood in the densest community, um, but there are a lot of people who are hungry. On top of the half a million from the Human Services Agency and the 1.9 million from the Board of Supervisors, the CCDC committed an additional $100,000 to the relief program, bringing funds up to $2.5 But 
Young says they're not stopping there. And we're now trying to raise an additional million dollars from foundations and private funds to bring the total program budget up to three and a half million. Um, and, and um, you know, we got an immediate um, a contribution from Crankstart Foundation of $500,000. So that was a huge boost. And, um, you know, we are now uh, well on our way to, um, you know, relaunching and getting the program rolling. And SF New Deal has just been amazing to work with. Chelsea Hung said that when San Francisco allowed outdoor dining again, their restaurant invested in an outdoor platform. So that helped a little bit. You know, we also just had to become more innovative and adapt to the times, offering meal kit, just creating different ways to provide more convenience to people during this time. So it, it's just been a really emotional roller coaster, to say the least. Um, but we've definitely grown and adapt and we've tried so many different things. Now, you know, things are starting to pick back up. Uh, we've opened our outdoor dining again. Um, we're in a couple other meal programs. Um, we were able to hire more of our employees back. So I think things are starting to be better, <laughs> but there's still a lot of uncertainty still, unfortunately. Hung grew up in Chinatown. Her parents have been in the restaurant industry for over 30 years, but when they wanted to retire and sell the restaurant, she was living in New York, working at a tech job. A comfortable nine to five. Um, and when I heard the news, it kind of made me think again about if I was ready to just see our family business um, you know, gone. Um, so I made the decision to actually come back and take it over. As of next month, it's actually our 25th year anniversary for Washington Bakery and Restaurant. Um, it's just funny because I worked at tech companies that helped entrepreneurs and, you know, I became one myself. So I kind of feel like I came full circle. Um, the restaurant just has a really deep place in my heart and so does the community. I just wasn't ready to let it go yet. Um, I saw a lot of potential and opportunity there and I still wanted to be a part of that community. So what does the future of Chinatown look like, especially after everything that's happened in 2020? Here's Malcolm Young. I will say that, you know, one of the bright spots that I've seen in this pandemic is the, the way in which our young people have stepped up and in. What we've seen from our youth team, you know, which is amazing, is this process whereby um, a lot of the high school youth who've been participating in the program are, are beginning to sort of serve as resources for a lot of our seniors by teaching them, um, you know, how to use Zoom, how to, you know, basically exist in this online world um, to the point where um, we've begun to really see uh, a lot of our um, grassroots organizations begin to, to meet again, but doing it virtually. On the other hand, they're also um, kind of pivoting on their own projects. Uh, one of the programs that we normally do in, in regular uh, times is uh, the, the youth team actually designs their own tours of Chinatown, where they, they do it from the framework of their experience and how it connects to Chinatown. And, and what they've done, uh, and, and this is the thing I think that's blown me away in, in so many, like just, they've created a Minecraft version of Chinatown, and they're now launching a Minecraft uh, online tour um, to be able to continue this activity. And I'm, I'm just, you know, and I'm, I, I, you know, I'm like, wow, if this is our future leadership. I think we're going to be pretty good. It, it's, it's really exciting. While this forced hiatus has been a time for projects and innovation, it's also been a time for reevaluations. You see, nobody has escaped the hardships of this pandemic. Brandon Jew from Mr. Jew's actually had to furlough all of his hourly staff back in December when outdoor dining shut down. I think that that restaurant that was, you know, 2019 is not the it's not the restaurant that I want to reopen. And I think this pandemic has really given me the opportunity to rethink what our priorities are and and like how to how to actually have a better restaurant inside and out for the future. The pandemic has reframed priorities. It's demanded transformations and resiliency. But a year on from the start of the pandemic, despite all the hardships and all the unknowns of the future, Chu points to signs of hope. 
even you know going to and from Chinatown, the energy is starting to come back. The markets are are more full. The things that kind of give me indication that tourists still want to kind of like experience Chinatown is like just from people asking me, "Hey, what do you what do you eat around here?" Or like, can you point me in the direction of this or that? It, you know, it kind of makes me. Happy to to like have to answer those because it gives me the sense that some of it is, is coming back. This year it feels different because I feel like what we went through. I think I, I think I feel finally optimistic. I might be becoming more superstitious, but you know, last year was year of the rat. I mean, it kind of proved to be a lot of the characteristics of a rat, which is to me like being scrappy, staying alive, doing anything to continue and. I think this year being the year of the ox, you know that that kind of consistent, reliable, head down kind of just workhorse kind of like、um, I kind of feel like thinking about that having the new administration and I just feel like there's been a little bit of a focus of of like not only like getting our restaurant back up and. Getting our employees back, but also I think an overall like sense of optimism for for Chinatown. All right, let me see here. Let's shut this down and get back over here. What I get,、um, took from this whole thing, my royal family, is that,、um, like I said earlier, that many businesses in America. Were affected by coronavirus, and what I gathered from this is the Asian community realize that they heavily depend on black dollars. They don't give a damn about us, but they gonna do whatever they got to do because they want us to patronize them. So. I give them a hundred feet because I don't trust it. You know what I'm saying? I don't trust the whole process. I don't think they're genuine or real because one thing you're saying a bunch of different things. You're saying、um, that disproportionately black people are coming into your community and whooping on your ass, and then you're looking at your bottom line too as well. So there's there they, they got to make some executive decisions. Do y'all want to just、um, focus on? That black folks disproportionately are coming in your community and just committing all these crimes, or do you want to reinvent yourself so we can come in and patronize your businesses? Well, I'm gonna tell you where I'm at with this. True Royal will not ever again patronize your businesses. You've been core ass nasty to us, you know, and that edge is still there. But you're feeling some kind of way, cause you understand the color of green. Oh yeah, you understand that very, very well. So as we continue on, my royal family, we're almost getting to the end of this. Now, lean all up on this. At this Chinese restaurant is typically a busy hour. That was before the pandemic. Fried rice, please. Now at Canton House in Atlanta, it's mostly empty tables and an unusually quiet dining room. My God, the business dropped ninety. The restaurant industry was among the hardest hit during the coronavirus pandemic, but owner Cam Wong is facing a struggle unique to Asian Americans: a double whammy of historic unemployment and discrimination. At the time we closed, we do have our window was broken, and with a hammer, without any reason whatsoever. At that time, we we at that time we really think that's racism. As COVID-19 has spread, so has the racism and xenophobia. Members of the United Nations Committee on Discrimination recently expressed concern over an alarming level of racially motivated incidents against Asian Americans, saying President Trump's rhetoric seems to play a role in legitimizing the hate crimes. Sixty-year-old Wang reopened his dining room in May. Business is still down 50%. He wonders if discrimination is slowing down recovery. 
when we when uh, when we first opening, I do have a feeling that the uh, people say don't go to Chinese Chinese restaurant. People were avoiding Asian businesses because they thought um, they would get the coronavirus from these businesses. An, an economics professor at the University of Massachusetts says COVID-19 has taken a heavy economic toll on Asian Americans. According to government statistics from February to June, Asian American unemployment rates increased by more than 450 percent. Asians typically have uh, among the lowest unemployment rates and it's really shot up during COVID. A visit to Atlanta's Chinatown underscores the struggle. This gift shop is closing at the end of the month. Other businesses here tell us they are just trying to survive. Yet Kim says few are taking notice. I think it's been overlooked because people don't think that Asians. I think it's been overlooked because people don't think that Asians have problems. People think. But Vuong, who came to the United States as a refugee from Vietnam, remains hopeful. He says he's been living the American dream for 40 years and hopes for 40 more. We have a dream to get to business to have a house, to have a stable life, peaceful life, have a family, and then raise our kids. But hopefully we are, our dream not broken because of this COVID-19. Wong tells me that he just started breaking even, so he's got quite a ways to go still. He's concerned about a second wave of COVID-19 hurting his business, but he says he's the most concerned about the outcome of the presidential election and whether that will inflame racial tensions. Well, you heard what he said, my royal family. That was quite deep. Um, he's 60 years old, but he's been doing fine for the last 40 years. And see, there is a fear. There is a fear. They have been standing by the sidelines watching violence be projected on us, us being shot down in the streets of America. Them people don't hire us. So these little fake-ass gestures don't mean shit. They fear, oh, they're not hiring us. Oh, we're going to get a unquote nigga moment. Yeah, they fear this as we continue on. The pandemic has taken a heavy economic toll on minority owned businesses. And according to a recent Fed survey, Asian Americans have been hit the hardest. Nearly 80% of Asian owned businesses described their financial condition as fair or poor. That's more than any other race or ethnicity. Here's CNBC's Kate Rogers. Nancy Yu has been in business for some 20 years, running her retail storefront Asia Star in San Francisco's Chinatown. She's weathered ups and downs, but nothing quite like 2020. Sales are down 80%, but she still opens her doors every day to send a message. I think it's important that we open, we, we stay open, even though there's no businesses coming. The San Francisco Chamber of Commerce says the zip code where Chinatown is located, which also houses the hard-hit financial district, has seen an outsized impact during the pandemic as it relies heavily on tourism. 75% of storefronts were not operational at some point in 2020, compared to the city average of 54%. Minority-owned businesses are more likely to be non-employer firms. Advocates say lenders may have been less incentivized to make smaller loans to those micro-businesses under the PPP last year. And smaller companies don't always have the established banking connections or manpower to apply for aid. I think um, this pandemic uh, in many areas, and this one in, uh, included, um, has shown the di digital divide uh, that people who had access to and, and the skill set uh, to apply for PPP, which is not an easy thing to do, um, maybe got left out. Beyond the pandemic's impact on business, the Asian American community facing a painful threat, an uptick in violence and racism over the last year. We want to let people know that we are here for peace, we are here for prosperity, we are here for American dream. You know, we have the same dream, that's why we came to America. While incomplete, the latest PPP demographic data show Asian loan recipients trailing other minority groups with about 60,000 loans approved so far. Nancy was able to access a loan, and she's staying optimistic, planning to open a second location selling boba tea later this year in Chinatown. Chef? Mm -hmm. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching. Now, did y'all catch that, my royal family? Gonna open a second one. But at the end of the day, 
they it, 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 it's it's a it's a day of reckoning it's a day of reckoning because they're gonna have to make some decisions you want to keep practicing what you're practicing in order for them to have the unquote american dream they need our capital yeah so it ain't our it ain't it's not um our responsibility to support any of them at the end of the day but they but the things that they have projected and they know what they have projected you know they have those ill feelings towards us but really at the end of the day green matters opposed to black lives matter because our money don't stay in our community at all you know they have monopolized on everything and i think what is shaking them to their core also is a combination of also that they're not getting hired as much and the way esau gets down they have turned their whole world upside down because they do a lot of the hiring. And it's like, whoa, we getting a nigga moment. And they ain't saying that, but that's what they getting. And that's what all these races fear at the end of the day, my royal family. So like I said, I had to do a very thorough, because I had to process within myself, you know, and see what, we'll get caught up in is disproportionately keep saying over and over and over again, oh, that's wrong that um, they, you know, pushing on these Asians and attacking them. It's wrong to do it to anyone, damn it. Why you keep just focusing on one certain group of people, you know? But we disproportionately getting shot in the streets of America and y'all all have had an indifference. I talk about that in Royal Smoke and Royal Fire. Y'all all going to get this. I told y'all this a long time ago. Many have in the Royal family have told y'all ass about you going to feel one day. So we're in this space and time and you're feeling some kind of way. And the thing that's deep, you ain't even begin to receive Yahweh's wrath. Oh, yeah, you haven't. But I tell you this. Render your voice with your beautiful divine words. And it's always my royal family. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your support. And with that said, Ashe.